Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, before we get started, I wanted to remind everybody that this webinar is going to be recorded. So don't feel like you'll miss anything. If you need to pop out for just a second or if you want to watch it again later, it will be available by the end of the day. Um, the Q&A is going to be open. So if you have any questions at any time, please feel free to pop them in there and Greg will be do his best to uh, answer them in real time. Um, so I want to thank Greg for being here. Um, Amplify wouldn't be what it is without our amazing speakers. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn this over and let Greg do his thing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nicole. I appreciate you a whole bunch. Welcome everybody. Now look, I'm on the East Coast, so it's it's 4.01 by my clock, and I'm looking at the time slot and I'm going, who in the heck is gonna be watching me? It's quitting time on Friday. But listen, I appreciate you being here. We're gonna talk to you about building a talent pipeline, right? And, and really for me, this is about easing the strain of finding employees. Now what you just heard was, hey, he's gonna find his great employees. Yeah, no. No, I wish I was. If I had the ability to do that, then you and I'd be sitting on a beach in Cancun somewhere, right? Because we know how challenging finding talented people is. And unfortunately, and I know you don't want to hear this, and it was years before I was willing to say this to you, there's no easy solution. There, there is no silver bullet. You know, cut Two years ago, I was in Atlanta at this national conference, and there were 200 people uh, in this amphitheater and in names you would recognize businesses you would recognize manufacturers you would recognize it was a a just a huge cross cut of the automotive industry and they're going through this industry survey and the survey showing average age of technicians is going up and up and up and 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 there's fewer and fewer kids coming into the industry and all this and finally i stood up 200 people i stand up they bring me a microphone the guy sticks it in my face and i said excuse me but is there anybody in this room that can tell me that this has ever been any different ever. I've been over 30 years in the industry and I look around and I start seeing a few heads nodding and it hasn't been any different. It's always been hard to people. It, it's hard to find people. Is it a little bit harder now? Maybe, maybe, but look at that point, I changed the way I looked at it. I stopped trying to find you great people and stopped trying to, to say, oh, hey, you know, instead of a monster, remember monster? Instead of monster, you know, let's go to Indeed. Let's go to wherever. And I said, you know what? Let's look at what the best businesses in our industry do. The ones, and I knew some at the time, the ones that, that people are knocking on their door going, hey, you have any openings? Hey, I thought maybe you'd have an opening. Hey, just moved into town. You look like a great shop. You have any openings? What are they doing? And so I started looking at them and, and yeah, the bummer is that there is no short term solution, but, but that's not, that's not the biggest, the, the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is the best solutions being long-term mean that you have to get a little bit more invested. Okay. And so I am going to give you ways of filling your talent pipeline and I'm going to weave a bunch of them together because nothing in our industry, I taught that technical for, I don't know, forever. And I used to say to the students in the, in the training programs, there is nothing in that automobile that functions in isolation. Meaning you can't change one input and not have something else change. And the same is true for business management. You can't change one thing in your organization and not have everything else change. So if we're going to build you a, into a machine, into a, a, an organization that can build a true talent pipeline, then your business is going to change. And in this way, it's going to change for the better, okay? So the, the other good news here is if we know there's no short-term solution, then let's just start now. Let's not wait. And, and those shops that just, that wait, and they're, they're waiting for somebody else to solve the problem, that is such a waste of time, isn't it? Start now. Everything I'm going to give you this afternoon in the short amount of time that we have you can do tomorrow. You can start, well, maybe not open on Saturdays because we're filming this on Fridays, but you can start on Monday then. You can think about it over the weekend, all right? You can start now. And everything I'm going to present to you will make your business better. It'll help your business stand on its own without you, which is ultimately what you want, and it will make it more profitable, all right? So 
I'm going to, I'm going to jump to a diagram. I'm going to skip this slide. I may come back to it. I'm going to skip to this slide because I wrote the whole program and I went, you know what? They need a, they need a diagram to see where my head is at. Cause I can't just throw three pillars of a talent pipeline up there. That just, uh, you know, no. So take a look at this. So up top, across the top here, these five things we have, I can do this. We have five things here. Those are potential employee sources. And, and when I say recruiter, I don't, I don't mean the headhunter kind of recruiter. I'm talking about the, the Indeeds and the Monsters and the whoever else out there you might use. You've got the big guys that you know of that, that you have eh, every now and then somebody has success with them. Most of the time, there's not a ton of success, but whatever. And then you've got some, you got some new ones showing up on the scene. These are smaller. They're getting going. Maybe they're, they're pointed at the trades. Maybe they're pointed at the automotive industry specifically, but but they're, they're still kind of, honestly, in my experience, they're kind of floundering a little bit. They don't really know the waters that they're, they're swimming in. You've got, the, you've got the ubiquitous Craigslist because when all else fails, what do you do? You stick an ad on Craigslist and you know what you get from Craigslist, right? And then, and then you've got these two over here that are interesting. You've got the advisory board service and you've got employee referrals. And, and I wanna, I'm going to talk about those in just a second, but, but look, look at how this works. You've got these five sources, they all lead into what I call always be hiring. You see, I will explain to you that my philosophy is we don't just hire when we need somebody. Now, this sounds insane, but Greg, hold on, bear with me, we'll get to it. If you feed all these potential sources into always be hiring and you do this hiring process well, which you can do, then it leads to the building of shop culture. You've got the basement, you've got the, the, the foundation of shop culture. And I'm going to give you some tools where you can grow shop culture. So the three pillars of building a talent pipeline to me are these three. They're school advisory boards. We'll talk briefly about those. They're always be hiring. I'll explain that one in depth. And then we'll get as far into shop culture as we possibly can in the next 45 minutes or so. Okay, so this is what I'm calling the three pillars of your talent pipeline. And you have influence over them. That's why I, I chose these. If, if you look at this, you don't have a whole lot of influence here or here or here, right? You can write ads, you can hone your ads, but you know what they return. The thing is, if, if you can influence this and it feeds the always be hiring in any one of these other ones dumps, dump stuff in here, then all of a sudden you're feeding shop culture. You grow the shop culture and look where it goes. It goes right back up to employee referrals. And then it becomes cyclical. But you have to have these two big ones in the middle, always be hiring and shop culture. Let's talk about school advisory boards. Now you're going to see in a second, next slide, maybe the slide after that, that they need three things from you. They need advice. They need advocacy. And they need, I forget the third one. It doesn't matter. This is me advocating for them, right? It's me advocating for them because in my distance past, distant past, I, I taught high school and I taught college. And I'm telling you the school advisory boards are important. The challenge here is that it's your commitment to the industry. And it might be a, a technician that you send. It might be you yourself that goes. Maybe it's a manager. It really doesn't matter. It's, it's a commitment to give back to the industry. I understand that some of you are not anywhere near a school that you can sit on a, a, a high school or college automotive advisory board. I get it. That's why I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about this, but they need and want your guidance. It is a long-term commitment if you do it right. And I want to talk about doing it right. But before we do, we're going to go through the pros and cons of each one of these pillars. The pro with advisory boards is that you do get access to some raw talent. You get real access to it. I did a program a few years ago in Toronto and on a weekend and this guy raises his hand after I went through this whole spiel and, and he says, Greg, I've got a shop, I've got 17 employees and I'm here to tell you it took me 12 years but every one of my employees came from this, from this college program in, in Toronto. And he says, I wouldn't have it any other way. They're phenomenal. The problem is, and he turned to the group, he says, the problem is it took me 12 years. He says, this works, but you've got to have patience, you've got to have a program, and you've got to be willing to give it some time. And so that's the con. That's the first con, right? Is it just, it takes time. 
you build great relationships and you find the, the people that you want and you get to train them like you want and, and, and they don't have any bad habits, but they don't have any habits either, right? And so, and so it's time consuming on your part. And then there's the mentor thing. You've got you've to figure out a mentor program. You've got to work with the school uh, to, to work within their co-op program, the internship program, whatever they call it. So there are pros and cons to this. The biggest one takes time. So what I was saying earlier that the advisory board needs from you is advice, assistance, which is the one I'd forgotten about, and advocacy. What does that look like? It looks like they need to know what are today's required skill sets. The, the, the thing I observed on advisory boards years ago was that the school has one idea and you have a different idea and they don't exactly meet in the middle. And so that's where the school needs you. They, they've got to know what do you want in a basic entry level tech? We only have two years or three years or sometimes four years to give you somebody that has some base that you can work with. And so they need that advice on an ongoing basis. They need to know what kind of tools and equipment are they expected to be able to use when they come out of our program, because that's, that's changing all the time, right? What they don't want to hear from you is listen, you know what, Bob, when I came into this industry, I swept parking lot and cigarette butts for two years and I earned my way into this. And so now I'm a shop owner and, and that's what these kids are going to have to expect. That is not, that's not what they want to hear because a kid hears that or sees that or experiences that the kid's gone. That's part of our problem today. These kids don't, they don't have great experiences when they do come out into internship and co-op programs. And if we can change that for them, then you in particular might be able to solve part of your talent pipeline challenges. They want to know what can the kid expect in terms of a pay plan? What can they, I mean, you, we don't need to pump them full of, they're going to make $150,000 right out of college. Yeah, there's enough of that garbage out there, right? But, but let's be real about it. Here's what they can expect. If they're a certain skill level, here's what they can expect. And then they want to hear from you industry needs and they need advice around all of that. They need assistance placing these kids. Because look, as I said a minute ago, a lot of these kids don't have a good experience when they come out of a, a secondary, post-secondary program into a shop. And so they need you to work with the program to make it a better experience. They need you to help develop a mentor program within your shop. I get there's a problem. I get that's a challenge. I get that your people dictate how well that goes. That's a different program for a different day. I understand those challenges. I truly do. I've run them in shops like yours. But, but again, they need, to, they need help in, in, in understanding these things. They need help in securing resources. Maybe that's, a, maybe that's parts. Maybe that's connections. Maybe that's network. Uh, and, and they need you to come talk to the kids every now and then. And is it a commitment on your part? It is. And look, I, I've got a, a mastermind client right now. and he, he just rolls his eyes when there's an advisory board meeting. And I'm like, dude, they need you to go. And he's like, yeah, but I'm tired. I've been working all day. Eh. He's different now that he's able to work on his business and not in the business every day. When he was in the shop all day long, when he was on the service counter all day long, that was a problem for him. And so I understand that at the end of the day, that's the last thing you want to go do. I didn't want to do it. And I was on the other side of things. I get it. But it's super necessary, especially if we're trying to build a pipeline here. And then they need you to advocate for them. They need you to promote the school amongst the, the kids that you may know. They need you to consider a tuition reimbursement program. I'll show you one I like in just a second here. But they, they may need you to meet with, with you know, local, state, and, and maybe federal people to talk about trade programs and vocational programs and, and you know, why are these automotive programs going away when the industry is desperate for more employees. So they need the advice, the assistance, and the advocacy from you. Now, I'm going to move on from this subject, and I'm going to show you, before we disappear from it, I'm going to show you two things that you can use to attract employees today, because the world of employee compensation is changing a little bit, and there's some new ideas out there. So number one, if you're looking at young employees that maybe are still in school programs and whatnot, consider a tuition reimbursement program. This works really well for those college students that maybe you had you know, out of a high school co-op program, they want to go to a college, maybe they're going to a local college, and that's usually the case in, in this situation. And what you want to do with them is say, listen, you go through the application process, you figure out how you're going to pay for college, you know, pay for whatever you need to with student loans, 
And here's the deal. As long as you continue working for me, you can have time for your classes. But as long as you continue working for me, I will make those student loan payments. Now, some shops will wait until they're, they're out of college and they'll say they'll do this. Other shops will say, look, work for me while you're in college and I'll start setting that money aside. They'll do the same thing with tools. Because as you know, in our industry, that's a major investment and it can be a major barrier to kids coming in. Now, we all love tools and we walk on the Snap-on truck or the Mac truck. I pop out of our head and we sign up for the lifetime payment plan, right? But, but we don't want to do that. Some of these kids are smarter than that now. Um, not all the time, but some of them are. And so if you were willing to consider a tuition reimbursement program or a tool set program, what the tool set program would look like is you go to your Snap-on dealer or whatever dealer of your choice, and, and you say, this is a set that I want. I am buying it. I am paying for it. And you purchase that, whether it's on payment or cash or whatever it is, your business. And then you say to that new employee, whether it's a student or a new employee, you say to that new employee, as long as you work for me, then I am going to continue to make payments on these tools. Here's how much I'm going to pay a month. Even if, you've already, even if you're not on a payment plan, right? Even if you paid cash, you work out, here's, here's how much I'm going to pay a month. Some people say for every billable hour you turn for me, here's what's going to come off the tool bill. But as soon as those tools are paid for and you're still working for me, you get the tools. If you leave before this is up, the tools are mine because I already own them. And, and it works sometimes. I mean, it takes a certain individual, right? But consider tuition reimbursement. Consider the tool thing. There is a thought out there now. I saw it in the dealership world 20 years ago. and I'm starting to see it in the independent repair shop world where we're buying tools for the technicians now. That toolbox in their bay is ours. We own it. And, and you know, you work out a replacement thing if they're losing tools or leaving tools under the hood or whatever. Uh, but some shops are getting around this barrier of entry-level people coming in by purchasing the tools. So just some, some food for thought. Now, I want to move on to, in the next 40 or so minutes we have, 30 or so minutes we have, I should say, uh, I want to move on to the other two major pillars that are not only going to help fill your talent pipeline, but they're gonna help grow your business and get your business to stand on its own, okay? I guess I had one more slide here. I apologize for that. Now, um, the, this, this piece of advice, this piece of advice is probably the best piece of advice I have for everybody in the industry. It is also the by far most ignored piece of advice I have ever seen. Kind of. Look, always be hiring. It sounds kind of crazy, but it's really, really important. I think if you want to fill your talent pipeline, you have to always be looking. And what I mean by that is too many shops get when times are good, right? You've, you've had people for 12 years. You've got, you know, your, your, your stable is full out back. All your technicians fill your base. They're highly productive. It's awesome. They've been with you for, for whatever, 5, 10, 12, 15 years. Your service counter, they're, they're rock stars. They've been with you for 15, 20 years. And you get complacent. And you're like, you know what? Things are good. Or I see it in a different scenario too. Hey, I just hired two more technicians and a service advisor and they are working out fantastically, man. I am set. This is awesome. See, there's a problem with that. The problem is good people come and go. Good people come and go. Now, if I was smart, I would have put some graphs in here. I, I graphed some, some progress of some mastermind clients recently. And, and you could see in the graphs where stuff happened. And what I mean by that is you could see where an employee left or an employee got hurt or an employee got sick or an employee just went off the rails in one case. And good people come and go. And even if I watched a 17 year, we'll call him a veteran one day, decide in the middle of the day, you know what, I'm not doing this anymore and completely changed his career. I've seen that twice now. I saw one person become a dental hygienist, another person become a law enforcement officer after 17 years at the shop. And so stuff happens. But folks, think about it. If you wait until stuff happens, then who is going to be out there wandering around looking for a job? Maybe there's five people, right? And maybe one of those five are awesome. And so you're going to count on the fact that somebody awesome is wandering around this earth 
looking for a job in your market when you need them. Well, if you want to catch a world record fish, you had probably go better go fishing more often than every now and then, shouldn't you? And you better figure out where those fish are swimming. Because if, if, you're just, if you're just going out there to look for a technician when you need one, the pool of technicians out there is just what's out there in that time period. But if you're always looking for technicians, you get to see the bigger pool that's out there looking, even maybe when you don't need somebody. You buy insurance, and that's a bad bet, right? You're buying insurance, you're betting that nothing is ever going to happen. No, I'm sorry, you're betting that something's going to happen, and the insurance company's betting nothing will ever happen and they'll never have to pay out. And so you're all day long, you're like, yeah, I'll, I'll buy that insurance. I'll bet something's gonna happen. Okay, so why aren't you always hiring people? Why aren't you always having your ads out there just to see if the right fish come swimming by, right? You engage in marketing, don't you? A client called me up one day, he says, Greg, I just had an epiphany. I'm like, yeah, what's that, dude? He's always having epiphanies. He says, you know, you know how I never stop marketing and I'm the busiest shop in town? And I said, yeah. He says, you're kind of driving at that without always be hiring thing, aren't you? If I'm always hiring, then I'm, I stand a better chance of finding the right people. Yeah, that took three years to come through. Three years. But that's what I'm talking about, folks. You've got to always be hiring. Now, the pro to this is that it will work. It does work. The con, as with the last one, the advisory board is, eh, it takes time. And you've got to pay attention to all those sourcing channels we're talking about. You've got to have your ads out there all the time. I get that it costs money. But it gives you a chance to fine-tune those ads. It gives you a chance to move around channel to channel see which one's producing better for you. And, and I'll more on that in just a second. So I'm not going to say that's a, a total con. It's just, it takes time maybe, but it's going to take time anyway. So if I wait till I lose somebody, it's going to take me five months to find them, the new person. Would I rather not take five months to find a new person while I still have the other person? Yeah, I would. Now the pro I think is you're going to get a lot better at interviewing and finding people. One of the challenges that I see in the industry is how often do you hire? I mean, if you're a good shop, which I know all of you are, you're not hiring that often. So what? how good are you going to get if you only interview every now and then? If I'm interviewing once a year, twice a year, can you imagine diagnosing an electrical problem once or twice a year? How good are you going to be at diagnosis? You're not. So when people say, oh, I keep hiring the wrong people, it's because you suck at interviewing because you don't interview. And when you do interview, the pressure is on. Because you need somebody, you need a body at that point. It's been four months, Greg. It's killing my production. Yep, it is. So if you're always hiring, then you're always interviewing and you're going to get better. And that's, that's one of my big cases for this. Yeah, you're going to have a bunch of crappy interviews. Okay, so what? Take them all is what I say. Take them all because you're not under pressure right now to hire anybody. You don't need them. You're full up. But you're still looking for good people. Wouldn't you rather know that that technician exists and wants to work for you than, and not have room for them than need them and not know they exist because they found a different job somewhere? Because here's the thing HR will tell you. HR people tell you all the time that when you interview all these people and you, and you narrow down your candidates and you decide who you want and you have to pick one out of three maybe, you know, I mean, that's a luxury, not in our world. But you pick one out of three, the other two go get different jobs. You have no idea whether they, they wanted to work for you, but you have no idea how happy they are at those other jobs. And an HR person told me recently, we always call them and most of them will come work for us. They'll leave that job and come work for us. And so if you do the interviews and you know you want somebody and you don't have room for them, they know you already and you know them. And that's not to say that 12 months from now when somebody else doesn't work out or somebody else leaves, you call them up that they're not willing to come to you because they liked you. Because you built awesome shop culture, which is the third pillar. All right, so there's, I think the pros here outweigh the cons, big time. The other one, maybe it's 50-50. But here's the big message that I want to I wanna deliver to you. If you're always hiring, there's no pressure. If you're, if you're hiring because you need somebody and you've lost a service advisor and you've lost a technician, you're down to two technicians and you're writing service, 
you're under the gun, right? You're under the gun. You're pulling your hair out because you don't have time to interview because you're working the calendar, but you have to interview. And no wonder we're not good at interviewing. There's too much pressure. No wonder we're not good at writing one ads or we don't have time to get chat GPT to write one ads. If we're always hiring, we have this time and the pressure is off. Okay. So I can't make you always hire, but I can push back when somebody says this to me. Oh yeah. But Greg, what happens when my people see the ad and they find out they think I'm going to replace them? Yeah. Okay. Here's my answer. You can see it. All right. Johnny, we're a growing business, right? Would you agree we're a growing business? And you like to work with really good people, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm always looking for really good people. If I wait till we lose somebody, my chances of finding somebody really good, just wandering around out there needing a job at the same time we need somebody, they're slim. So this fool I saw on TV one day said, always be hiring. And I bought it. I drank the Kool-Aid. And so I'm always hiring. I'm not saying I'm going to replace you. But I'm saying I want to know who's out there that's really good because we want the best. And as we grow, we want to fill the bays and the service counter slots with the best. And they usually don't push back. And it's also like knowing that you're recording their phone calls. They'll remember it for a little while and they'll try to be right on with the, with the recordings, right? Because they know you're listening. They know you're listening. And then what happens after a few days? They forget about it. You keep your ads out there all the time. It's just like they forget about security cameras and they forget about the fact you're recording their phone calls. They will forget about it. Worst case, if they don't forget about it and it puts more pressure on them to perform, isn't that good for you? Isn't it really good for them? They're stepping their game up. So I don't buy this. I don't buy this at all. Always be hiring, okay? The worst thing that can happen is you find somebody awesome and you got no room for them, but you know they exist. It is far better than losing people and then trying to figure out how to replace them. This is your biggest challenge though. This is why nobody takes this advice because your stable is full. You don't feel the urgency. You move on to something else. Folks, make this a habit. Try to do one interview a week. Can you imagine interviewing 50 people a year? Do you think you'd find somebody good if you could get 50 people a year to interview? All right, so, so make that your target. Make, start with once a month if you want to. It will help you fill your talent pipeline. Now, here's the thing I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you your hiring process because you need a better hiring process than you have. Maybe some of you are already doing this. I don't know. I don't meet many that do. Number one, when you find somebody that answers your ad, and because I said you're targeting one a week or one a month, you're going to do the interview. Here's what you're going to do. Number one interview is a telephone interview. You're going to call them up. You're going to have a conversation with them. What does that do? That tells you what their phone skills are like. That tells you if they can articulate their point or not. That tells you if it's somebody you're even interested in experience-wise, skill level-wise, all that. Right? So you kind of, you weed through all the, all the stuff with a phone interview. Now, if you like them and you still think, ah, you know what? Let's talk to them. I tell people all the time, talk to them anyway especially if you're just getting going in this, because the more comfortable you get with the interview, the better you're going to be and the better people you're going to find. So, so even if you're, eh, I don't know, interview them second time, but don't do it at the shop. Do it offsite. Take them to lunch. Take them to breakfast. You know what that does? Does two things, two big things. There's a whole bunch of things, but two big things. Number one, you get to see how they interact with the public. You get to see how they treat other people. You get to see what they're like around other people. That's a big thing because they got to work with your team. So you got you to know what they're like. And then number two, it's a lot less pressure on them, let alone you, outside the shop. They will relax and they'll start talking to you a little bit more. Use this interview to find more about who they are as a person. Why do they like working on cars? Why do they like serving people? Why, do they, why are they in the automotive industry? You know, where do they live? How long have you been there? You know, do you know so-and-so? And have a loose conversation with them just to kind of get to know each other. Because if you don't like their personality, you're not going to want to hire them. At least you get some food, right? But, but it relaxes them a little bit. Now, what we're after with all this, I'm not going to lie to you. What we're after with all of this is if you do three interviews, because the third one's coming up, you do three interviews, it's awful hard for them to BS you three interviews long. It just doesn't hold up. They can BS you on the phone. 
And then you meet them in person and it starts to break that thing down. And then if you still want them on the fence or maybe you really like them, then you bring them on site, bring them to your shop and do a third interview with them. Now, more on that in a second, but that third interview is where the BS has to go away. They can't tell that same lie that long. It just doesn't hold up. And so this process, along with always hiring, really helps you hone in on the better people. Because you don't want to hire just a warm body that can fog a mirror and then have turnover once a month or once every two months or even once a year. Turnover costs you ridiculous amounts of money. So do the on-site interview. And here's the thing, when you do the on-site interview, have more than just yourself interview them. Have somebody else interview them too, but practice interviewing with that other person. Because just like you may not be awesome at interviewing because you don't do it a whole lot, if you get your, your service advisor, your service manager, or a technician to do an interview too, how many interviews have they ever done? Fewer than you have. So set them up with some easy questions, set them up with some role play so you get them comfortable, but have more than one person interview. And then when you decide on somebody, make an offer to them and their significant other, all right? Because as a friend of mine said, and look, I didn't make this up. I borrowed it from a friend of mine. I thought it was genius when he invented it. He said to me, Greg, when I hire this person, their family is committing just as much as they are because their family can make them late for work. Their family can keep them out of work, calling out sick or whatever. And, and so they need to commit to me too. And I can tell you in the real world, when my clients have done this, there have been tears because it is so out of the ordinary and it makes people feel so good. So use this, adopt this as your hiring process. Now, I am running out of time rapidly here, which I always do because I talk too much. We've got about 20, we'll call it 22 minutes left. And I want to move on to that last pillar. So your first pillar was get on a school advisory board, understand what that board needs from you, commit to them in the long term. It will work. It's a long-term commitment. It's slow. It's frustrating. I get it, but it does work. Your second pillar of filling your talent pipeline is to always be hiring and implement that hiring process. Now, your third pillar kind of goes with the always be hiring thing. People ask me all the time, Greg, how do I change my shop culture? And I tell them, if you want to change shop culture, number one, it comes from top down. And number two, you've got to hire differently. Let's figure that we've got the hiring thing down because you're a rock star. Now, shop culture. What is shop culture? It's a set of values, practices, and, and behaviors, a way of doing things that all the employees embrace. They all understand why they do it that way. They all believe in why we do it that way. And it becomes your organization. It's formed through consistency, but consistent practices, consistent management practices, consistent hiring practices, consistent decision-making practices. And, and I make it sound simple. You know it's not that simple. But we want a group of people that think alike to move the business in the same direction, pull all together in the same direction. Because remember, if you go all the way back to that diagram a half hour ago, what ultimately do we want out of this? We want that funnel, that pipeline to feed into shop culture, but we have such an awesome shop culture that those employees are seeking other employees. Because like I'm saying all the time, good people attract good people. And so if you build a great culture, they're going to attract other people that want to work within that culture. That's how the best companies in the world do this, guys. And that's how the best shops do this. Now, pros and cons here. Pro, big pro, I think. It's you attract employees to you. If you build the right shop culture, you're pulling employees to you. And like I said a while ago, when I looked at the best shops, the shops that weren't hurting for people, that had no problem filling their bays, no problem filling the, the empty spots on the service counter, that's what was going on. They had a reputation in their community that anybody in the automotive world wanted to work for them. And, and so this gentleman, he never struggled. Did he interview six people and pick one? Yeah, because five of them were awful. But you know what? Six people wanted to work for him. And he says, yeah, I'm blessed. He says, a lot of times I don't have to go looking for anybody. 
The con, as with every one of these, are you getting the message? It takes time. It takes time. It, it takes persistence. You have got to be consistent, persistent, and patient for all of these things to, to make them happen and successful. Your organization, though, if you can embrace the shop culture thing and do a few of the things I'm going to show you in a, in a minute, your organization is going to begin to operate on its own. Now, that's really good for you. I don't need to tell you that. But it's also great for the employees because if they all get around, get along well enough and they, and they, can, they can control and, and, and manipulate and influence this business in all the right ways, then camaraderie is high. Shop culture is very positive. They, they all have fun when they go to work and customers feel that. Customers get that, right? Will you have to let go of some employees? Maybe. Maybe you will if you want to change your shop culture or improve your shop culture. But you know what? We're talking about replacing them anyway, right? So that's okay. Because when you do that and you hire right, you're going to build a stronger community base, which is going to lead to a stronger consumer base. So I think, again, here, the pros outweigh the cons. Advisory board, they're probably 50-50. Always be hiring pros way outweigh the cons. And then shop culture, these pros way outweigh the cons. All right? So when you do hire, if you want to, to create an awesome shop culture and you want to not hire as often, so you maybe you don't have to have as big of a talent pipeline, you absolutely have to onboard your employees. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, we're not going to get all the way through my presentation. This might be, other than the always be hiring advice, this is the most important advice at the end of this presentation. The onboarding process is critical and nobody's doing it. Nobody is doing it. We make assumptions about what the new hire knows. We make assumptions about, oh, you know what? They used Mitchell in that old shop. We use Mitchell here. They're all set. Maybe, or maybe not, or probably not, because they don't know how you want it done. And, and they may not have been putting any information in Mitchell at the other shop. I mean, yeah, is the learning curve shorter? Yeah, but that doesn't mean there's not a learning curve. You can't rush the onboarding process. We are so used to, as technicians, we're so used to looking to see what's wrong, going, oh, get a part. When we look to see what was wrong, oh, we're missing people. Get some people. We got some people, get the part. Put the part on the car. Get the people. Put the people in that, in that spot. All right, done. We're fixed. That's how we think. But that is not, not the way this people management thing works. That gets you in more trouble because you're making assumptions that I diagnosed it, I got the part, I put the part on, part fixed it. That's not the way it works with people, okay? If you, if you Google, just Google onboarding employee statistics, all right? I grabbed a couple for you, but they are mind-blowing to me. Those companies that have a formal onboarding process increase retention up to 82%. Can you imagine that? I mean, even if it's 50%, good Lord, that is freaking awesome, isn't it? What about revenue increase? Well, you know why the revenue increases 60%? Because they understand what they're doing. They understand what you want them to do. They understand how the system works. And once they're working in the system the way you want them to, and it's working along with everybody else, yeah, revenue can increase. You probably hired right too, was the other part that I, that I would guess. The onboarding process ensures that you don't have as many problems to deal with, as much chaos to deal with. Is it a challenge as a manager to implement an onboarding process? Yeah, it is. And look, if you want a full-on process, get a hold of me. All right, get a hold of me. I'll give you a full-on process. But onboarding, folks, is not shadowing. It's not go stand next to Tom for the next week. Tom will show you how to do it. That is not onboarding. It's not up to one person, Tom, in my example. And it is not throwing them to the walls. Yeah, but Greg, that's how I learned. I just jumped right in. I figured it out. Do you have time for somebody to jump right in, not figure it out, replace them, and do the same thing with the next person? No, that's what's costing you money. So it's not sink or swim. It's not just shadowing. It's got to be a full-on process. During the onboarding thing, while you're in, and we're talking 90 days, at a minimum 30 days, but I like 90 days. For the first week, you're going to talk to them every single day. 
Before they go home, I want you to sit down and talk to them for at least five minutes. If you give them 15, that's even better, but at least five minutes. And then at the 30-day mark, the 60-day mark, the 90-day mark, have a formal review process. I'll get the paperwork for you. I'll give it to you. All right? But you've got to set clear, documented goals and expectations for them to accomplish throughout those time periods. And, and that's what having a formal onboarding plan is. Again, I have a formal one for you. You want it, let me know. Get a hold of me. We'll talk. Before they even show up. So you get somebody, you make that offer to them and their significant other. They show up on whatever date, but before they show up, I want you to do these things. I want you to have a meeting with everybody, breakfast or lunch. I don't care which, probably breakfast works better. Bring the new person in. They're not gonna remember everybody. They're not gonna remember everybody's names, but isn't it a heck of a lot better on your first day of work to show up and recognize a few faces and maybe remember a name or two because you had breakfast earlier? And it's better for your existing employees too. This works. I've watched the magic with this work. All right. Reach out. Let them know. We're excited that you're coming. I know, I know a shop that, that, and they space this out. They'll have them fill out some paperwork. They'll, they'll send them a little bit of paperwork. They'll, actually, I have a packet that they'll hand them with a checklist in it. And they'll call them up a few days later and say, hey, what, what size uniforms do you need? And they'll call them up a few days later and say, hey, I got your business cards. If you want to stop by and pick them up. And they, you, know, you can think of it as stringing them along. But what's that doing for the employee? The employee suddenly feels like, oh, wow. They're, they're like, they really are excited. You see, what, one of my major pet peeves with employees is when a shop owner says to me, Greg, I have no way I'm ordering uniforms so I know they're going to stick. And I'm sure as heck not getting business cards so I know they're going to stick. Okay, so I show up at your shop. I'm the new hire. I don't look like anybody else because I don't have a uniform like you. What's a, how am I supposed to interact with a customer? Customer thinks I'm some dude standing behind the desk because I'm not in the uniform like everybody else. Is there any wonder I don't stick around? If I show up and you have uniforms and you have business cards and you act like you're happy to see me, how does that make me feel? Am I not better equipped to have success? Because if I show up with any level of anxiety at all, and then you further my anxiety by showing me I don't fit in, you're not setting me up for success, right? So be ready for them to show up. Now, if you Google all this stuff, you'll find this, make it memorable, and they have parties and cakes. I'm not saying do that. I am not saying do that. I'm not fully bought in. But at least have their logins. At least have their uniforms. Have their email set up. Act like they're a dang employee because the message it sends is super important. And then that first week, have it really planned out. Here is everything I want you to learn in the first week. Have, have things for them to do. Little things, little things, but little things that give them wins, easy wins. You know, it says measurable goals here. Well, the goal can be by the end of the week, write one repair order. Okay. So I got five days to figure out how to write one repair order. I can do that. Meanwhile, you know what? I probably have people skills. I can talk to people. That's great. But you're playing the long game, folks. The long game. It took you five months to find this person. Why do you want them to hit the ground running? Because it took me five months to find them, Greg. Stop. Unless you want to do this again, really soon, let's give this some time, all right? And again, meet with them every day before they go home. Just a quick conversation. How, how's it going, John? What was today like? What'd you learn today? What'd you get done today? Are you, are you, on, are you on track for your weekly goals? And just have a quick conversation. It'll mean a lot to that new employee because you hired them. And so you're the only person they really had formal contact with, right? So why not have a conversation with them at least once a day? I think it's a great idea. Now, if you're big enough, and not all of you are, and I get that, or you're small enough that you can do this easily, but have that new hire meet with every individual in the organization, spend one hour with them. Just talking about what do you do? How do you do it? because that was the best thing that anybody ever did for me back in the day. And what it did for me was it helped me understand where do all these pieces fit? And how does my job influence their job and their job influence my job? And the, it was just knowledge. I was never gonna do their job, but if I understood more about their job, then it was so much better for me understanding that big picture. I hope that makes some sense. All right, so, so think about doing that. 
Now, there's an awful lot with the onboarding thing. And again, I, I think I've got a whole 30 day process. You want it, get a hold of me and, and we'll figure something out. So I also want to include this in the, in the 10 minutes or so that we have left here, fewer than 10 minutes. I want to talk to you about effective employee management. There are certain things that you absolutely need to do to be an effective manager of your organization. Now, I don't care if you're a manager. I don't care if you're an owner. That doesn't matter to me. What I'm talking about is if you're running your organization and you're managing people, there's some things that you should be doing. I hate it when he comes into the room like that. Tony Robbins, everybody. Tony Robbins. Now, look, I, whether you like him or not, it doesn't matter to me. He's right about this stuff. He suggests that every individual needs these six things. And so when I work with organizations, I implement processes, I implement pay plans that are going to support these six things. You see, every one of your employees needs to feel secure. They need certainty. They need to know they're going to get something in a paycheck every week. They need to know that, that the building's going to be there when they show up in the morning. They're going to have a job tomorrow. They, they, they need to know certain things to give them security. Now, that security motivates some people, and that's, that's our primary motivator for some people. But we also need uncertainty, ironically. We need variety. Because what happens when we get bored? We jump ship. We go to a different shop. That's not what we want. Most of the service advisors I talk to, and even technicians, I say, why do you do what you do? They go, ah, because it's something different every day. I love it. So we need certainty, we need uncertainty. We need to feel significant. We need to feel like we matter in this world and that we're connected to, to those of us, those around us, to the shop around us, to the employees of your shop. We need to feel like we're growing all the time. That's why you're here. You want to grow. And so growth is important to you. And then we want to feel like we're contributing to something bigger than ourselves. Now, I use pay plans to do a lot of that. You see, if I put the if I create a, a pay plan, and I'll give you the, the keys to a great pay plan in just a second. If I create a pay plan that puts the power to earn more money in their hands, not relying on me for a raise, and I give them tools and knowledge and goal setting, then that pay plan is going to create certainty. It's going to create a certain level of uncertainty because they're going to, it's going to be a feedback loop. Oh, this happened this week, my paycheck went up. This happened this week, paycheck went down. And all, all of a sudden, they're connecting to your business. And they're starting to figure out, oh, I have an influence on gross profit. Oh, I do influence revenue. Duh. Oh, I do influence hours per repair order. And they begin to get the feedback loop going, and they're connected. Great pay plans create accountability. That's ultimately what you want. You want them to be accountable to themselves as well as you. Right, so, so you can do a lot of things from a management standpoint to create these six things that every one of your employees needs. And the pay plans I structure, of course, we don't have time to get into the whole thing, but I give them a base pay. Base pay that, look, even on a bad week, they can get by on that. It's okay. If I'm changing a, like a technician's pay plan, I set it at about 30, 35 hours a week so that their incentive causes them to reach a little bit and they can get to a comfortable place. And they're like, yeah, okay, all right, that's not so bad. I can, I, you know, I get paid for 35 hours. I turn 40, I get like a regular paycheck. Okay, great. But you know what? If I turn 45 or I turn 50, I get, I make more money. And so I incentivize them on things they control. And I incentivize them on things the team controls because I still want the connection with the team. And if you do these things well, and you do these things right, then you create this culture of growth and it, and it becomes a learning organization ultimately. To get to a learning organization, you need to add yearly reviews, you need to add weekly meetings. I know that's blasphemous, weekly meetings. And you've got to get better at coaching and you've got to learn to audit a little bit. And if you do this, what happens is during the yearly reviews, people get a chance to, to say where they think they're at, hear where you think they're at. You guys come to a consensus as to how they're doing, you build a training plan, and then you have an accountability tool, the training plan. They'll go to class now. They won't fake it or they won't push back because it's bowling night on Thursday when they're going to an ADOS class or whatever it is. And they'll walk out of these, these reviews every year smiling in part because they get a pay raise too associated with the, with the review. A cost of living increase on the base pay, a, a, a performance increase on the incentivized piece. Now, when they come walking out 
of your office smiling after a yearly review and they're still smiling in next week's weekly meeting, what do you, what do you know now about the culture that you've just created? And when they're all smiling and they all feel like, you know what, this is a legit organization. Nobody else does it like this. And they know a friend of theirs is looking for a job. What are they going to say to the friend of theirs? Or you're looking for a new employee. Could you have an employee referral program at that point? And do you think you might get some really good people in your talent pipeline at that point? You will. I promise you that. Now, I know that this has gone by fast. I've thrown so much stuff at you, but I just want to say to you in a couple of minutes that we have left here, that the talent pipeline is truly up to you. You can't just sit there and wait for the universe to deliver you the employees that you need to build the business that you've always dreamed of. If you take initiative and you get on advisory boards, you take initiative and you say, you know what, I am always going to be hiring and I am going to work on that new hiring process and I am going to get better at interviewing and you do it, then magic starts to happen. And when the magic starts to happen, it leaks into your shop culture piece. And then when you see it leaking in there and you go, okay, I can make this even better if I implement, let's change pay plans to, to, to give those people those things that, that that guy said that they need. And, and let's put yearly reviews in place because I think that's really good to, to grow people and have those conversations. And let's have training plans. Let's go to destination events. And then all of a sudden you'll look back 12, 24, 36, 60 months from now and you'll go, wow, we have changed immeasurably. And now we are attracting great people. One last thing before I hand it back over to Nicole, when somebody moves into your area, do you know a technician, a service advisor, they move into your area because their spouse maybe moved for a job. Do you know what they're using to look around and see where they might want to work? Do you know that most of these people are not searching the want ads to see who's hiring? They're looking at Google. They're Googling shops like you to see what the customer reviews are like. And they're reading those reviews and they're picking up the phone and saying, hey, I am so-and-so. I'm looking for a job, just wondering if you're hiring. Instead of saying, no, we're not hiring, why don't you do an interview with them? Matter of fact, why don't you do three interviews with them, right? Because it's better to know they exist and know how to get a hold of them than never know they existed at all, all right? Folks, I will stick around for a, a couple of minutes here for, for questions. We got about two minutes before we got to end this whole thing. So if you have questions, put them out there, Nicole. I can hear her. She can talk to me and tell me all about them. And if I never hear from you again or never see, see you again, I'm going to sign off by saying this, as I always do. Keep up the great work and never, ever, ever stop learning. Thank you so much for attending Amplify 2024. I wish you all the best of luck in 2024, folks. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. See ya. Thank you, Greg. That was incredible. Um, I know that you could talk for another hour and keep going. Um, so I'm sorry to cut you off Maybe. here. Um, we did have a couple questions. Um, do you have any tips for social media hiring? Ooh, social media. So, you know, there's a new thought out there around social media, which I'm, and, and I'll admit, I'm not the world's biggest guru, but I do have to run some marketing people. And so they tell me this stuff. Uh, there's a new thought around social media marketing that, that really it's, it's good for brand building, but it's not really good for, for connecting with people. Even with that said, I still want those ads out there. I want the world to know that I'm looking for somebody because here's the thing. You don't know when somebody's uncle or aunt or mom or dad sees your social media piece because they're a customer of yours and their nephew or son or grandson or something is looking for a job. And so anytime I'm looking for somebody, or even if I'm always hiring, I always have at least once a month something out there. Hey, we're always hiring. Know anybody good? Send them our way. So that's the best advice I can give you there. Perfect. Is there a way for people to potentially get in touch with you or if they have any follow-up questions, is there any way that they can reach out to you for that? Of course. I'll give you my email. My email is my first initial last name. So it's G-M-A-R-C-H-A-N-D at shoppros.com. And that is shoppros. Oops, let me go this way. Shoppros with two Ps. So S-H-O-P-P. ROS.com. So gmarchand at shoppros.com. 
And I'm all over social media. You can find me out there. Google my name. You'll find some contact information. Perfect. And again, this was recorded. So if anybody wants to pop back in and rewatch it and catch anything that they might have glanced over before, um, you can absolutely do that. Um, I am going to have to shut this one down, um, but join us at the after party. Um, and thank you, Greg, for being here. It's been incredible. We're so lucky to have you today. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you.